This month, we're going to be checking in with some of our top athletes competing at the Paralympics, my Team Ireland teammates. It's all thanks to Toyota and their hashtag Start Your Impossible campaign. Our next guest is a Paralympic legend and an Irish sporting hero. His name is Jason Smith. He is a T13 sprinter. Jason, welcome to Off the Ball. Hello, how are we doing? I'm good. How are you? Very well. It's not often we get interviewed by another athlete. <laughs> I know. I just interviewed Nicole and she uh, she didn't know that I was interviewing her. And I was like, oh, by the way, <laughs> I'll talk to you later Guys. after training. <laughs> I know all your secrets. I'm going to tell everyone. <laughs> so this is a, a bit of a weird one, isn't it? It certainly is. Um, well, the pressure's on you. It's easier answering the questions than asking the questions, I think. Yeah, but it's also pressure on you because I have a really good memory. I remember a lot of things, Jason. <laughs> a memory actually that sticks out for me was in 2008. I don't know how this happened, right? Me and Michael McKillop somehow managed to get our way up to the VIP spectators section in the bird's nest in Beijing. And we got to watch your... Uh, medal ceremony for your the second gold medal that you won in Beijing. Can you remember that? No, um, I can barely remember what happened in Beijing. Never mind you guys getting up into the VIP lounge, and that's pretty impressive because I don't remember the Chinese um, being much room for a maneuver. You know, you can't kind of just chat them and wiggle your way in somewhere. So yeah, but I don't know you how you just manage that. You and I know what Michael McKillop is like. He can sneak <laughs> his way into anything. Um, but since 2008 and since your first Paralympic Games, you have been, you've, well, you've never been beaten. How do you keep that streak up and, and deal with that pressure? Yeah, um, I don't think there's one easy answer, um, to be completely honest. And I think um, a lot really is, is driven by motivation. Um, and how do you, you keep motivation at um, a high level? And I think when I look back throughout that time, what motivated me 10 years ago to what motivated me now um, is different. So I think there's a, there's a huge element of understanding and finding what motivates you throughout different cycles. Um, and another thing I think I've been very fortunate um, around a lot of that is is to being surrounded by uh, very good people and people who are you know amongst the best of, at what they do. So they're also there to to be part of that support and and help you and and make sure you uh, keep things at at that very high level. So I, I think it's probably been you know a combination of uh, both things that that have allowed me to to be consistent. What motivated you in the lead up to Beijing versus the lead up to London versus Rio and now? What what were the things that changed? Um, I think probably early days is 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 around the medals and um, the success of of the medals and you know being out there and perform and and I suppose seeing the rewards of of what you put in, um, and I, I don't mean it in a in a bad way, but now it's not so much about the medals as in um, for me at this stage, it's more about trying to and in, achieve incredible things, like to continue to be consistent and and um, kind of trying to do things that very few people do or or can achieve and show that. You know, it can be can be done, and I think that's obviously one of the 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 things that you look at uh, the Paralympics and para athletes. You look at often what the things you you can't do, and and for me, you know, that motivation has has, has changed from maybe the the physical things of of the medal to to more to what my journey represents to me and and the people's around people around me, and, and probably even more so too now with. Um, having a family, I mean, I have two little girls, uh, three and five, and at the end of the day, uh, they're going to also look to to me to what they and and my wife obviously to what they can do and, and achieve. And for me, it's trying to kind of do it or or show it in what I do through my example rather than than what I say. And I, I just 
I find that's uh, what continues to motivate me to to want to continue to 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 be very successful at that top level. Do you think uh, you two little girls know what Daddy does? We do, but I think they've got a skewed up uh, pers- perspective of what daddies do for work. You know, <laughs> the, the other kids probably go in and say, you know, my daddy does whatever, and someday she she says, my daddy runs, and they're probably thinking, your daddy runs for work. My daddy runs too, but that's not work, you know. So, um, I think the, like the youngest is three, and the oldest is five and a half, nearly six. So she she understands a little bit more. Um, and obviously go down to the track and and um, at times competition. But um, I think they're still probably a bit young. But um, you know they would have went all oh, being well to Tokyo, and I think that would have been um, an incredible experience. But um, obviously things have, have changed over the last year and um yeah i don't think they fully get it but you know they do get it a little would you uh would you like to encourage your girls to get into athletics um i definitely would around sport i'm not you know i'm not bothered if it's athletics or if it's not um for me i would like them to do what they they enjoy and you know, if they were they're good enough and wanted to be at that level, then I then I would encourage it. I would I don't I wouldn't try to force it. Um, and I think again from from my own experience, you've you've got to find what motivates you if you want to be operating at that very high level. And without that, you probably won't be able to to operate at that that level. Um, so. That's why I, I don't think I would I would force them down a direction, but I would, you know, encourage them and you know let them kind of decide and maybe I might do something slightly different. Maybe I might do something completely different in ten years, but um, they might become yeah. swimmers. You never know. You might have to get yeah, up yeah, at four uh, a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Will you be encouraging that? <laughs> well, thankfully I can't drive them to swimming, so <laughs> it'll be my wife's problem. Oh, your poor wife. Speaking of your wife, <laughs> um, does she? Uh, how do you manage dad life? I'm guessing, and like your athlete life, especially your recovery. I, I'm guessing your wife does an awful lot to help you, yeah. specifically target but, your recovery. And yeah, it's definitely like one of the the huge things that obviously, well, there's many things you do, you don't see. Um, you obviously see athletes out competing in that four year cycle or whatever once a year in a major championship but um you don't see what kind of goes on behind the scenes but um f- for sure like my my wife has to take up um a huge amount of of the burden of of everything else that goes around um family life and and even just for times how often I, I'm away mm. um like the reality is um from about and in about 10 days time I probably won't see them until uh, we come back in September you know like that's um, far from ideal and it's it's not great sometimes for the girls too because they don't don't quite understand it and 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 sometimes why I'm away so um, yeah like there's there's absolutely no way I could do what I do um, without my wife being as supportive as she is you know it, it doesn't always mean it's easy um but yeah um for sure i i couldn't and you know one of the things you do say there is actually around recovery which is huge as an athlete again she would um help obviously where she can but just as an athlete you you don't recover the same and you won't recover the same as as what i used to and it's also learning to adapt and change with your approach to training and what you do as the circumstances in in your life change as well yeah is it definitely sleep when the children are sleeping try and get all the naps in yeah it doesn't work out like there's any naps unfortunately (laughs) (laughs) i have to go on camp to get my naps most most athletes dread going on camps because it means a lot of hard work whereas you're like right i'm off bye see ya yeah it's actually the time i feel freshest (laughs) All the extra sleeps you get in. Um, You have been labelled the fastest Paralympian on the planet multiple times. How does that make you feel? Yeah, I mean, it's it's it is a nice title to have. Um, 
what I've never been somebody who, who gets too carried away with titles. Um, you know, titles come and go and, you know, other people run faster. Um, so I, as, as nice as it is, I, I don't really care. Not that I don't care too much. I just don't think about it too much. Um, for me, it's just about trying to, uh, I suppose the fastest Paralympian on the planet is somewhat looking backwards because that's what you have done and have achieved. And what you have done and have achieved is gone. It's past. You can't do anything about it. And for me, it's about looking forward and what I can change and what I can influence and, and how do I continue to uh, run fast. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why I don't look at it too much because I'm thinking about what I can influence, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Have you noticed when you look back on your past events or your past competitors looking forward, do you think in Tokyo there's going to be a big change on, in, in the talent and just mostly because of uh, maybe the media coverage that Paralympics is slowly getting more people know about Paralympics and more, more people are invested in Paralympics. Do you think there's going to be your heat or your final is going to be a lot faster than it has been in the past? I think for sure that's been the case um, really since 2012. And I I wouldn't say throughout this this whole point up to, to now, it's been everywhere across the board, but I, I find pockets of, of categories or events improve and then the other categories improve and just uh, slowly and surely, I suppose, the tides are rising and um, across everything. Um, so absolutely, and, and I know I've seen um, on the rankings this year that, you know, the there's a, somebody who's run uh, quicker than any of the other guys who, who have, who I've competed against um, over these last number of years. So there's right away somebody that's um, uh, improving the standard. And with Parasport, you just never know, you know, that's, that's, yeah. that actually is the thing is each year new people come along and the onus is on you to be prepared and set your stall out that those people are going to come along. And when they do, then you're at least prepared and in a position to um, still to be able to do something about it. But there's absolutely like, I know across a lot of the hundred meters, across a lot of categories, like there's there's been a lot of quick times and, and I think the standards only going to continue to improve. Um, and when I step back and look a little further into the future, when you think of LA yep. um, and the Americans, when they really get behind the games which they're going to do um, because of LA having it, then again you kind of talk about the the media presence and the sponsors and and everything that follows around um, America just means everything increases and and people see opportunities and um, I I don't see any reason why things uh, won't and I'm sure you've see it. I mean I don't know much about. Uh, the swimming categories and where everyone's at, but I'm sure you've seen it yourself within yours. Why not? Are you not like constantly just watching the swimming? God damn. <laughs> no, it's, it's hard enough keeping uh, tabs on myself and what I'm doing, never mind anybody else. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I completely agree. I even, even in Rio, I maybe got a fright, not maybe got a fright. I just didn't realize how much the whole world had stepped on. Like people were missing out on medals coming fourth, fifth, sixth, missing out on finals by 0 0.01 of a second. And that hasn't happened in the past. And it's really, really great that it is happening because it means the sport itself is getting more competitive and moving forward and more people are interested in it. But for the people who are in it, like, you know, I, I like winning. <laughs> Don't make uh... it too hard for me. <laughs> Do you... Um, would you keep an eye on the world rank rankings a lot to try and motivate you for, for training? Not really. I mean, I would keep an eye on it the, the odd time just to, to have a look. Not It's kind of back to this, um, like, if, if somebody comes and runs, you know, super, super, super quick, what can you actually do about it? <laughs> There's absolutely nothing. Yeah. So um, you, I nearly find... Like if you get caught into looking at India too much, you get 
caught into the negative side of it and worrying about it and getting concerned and and um for me it's just trying to focus on um what i can do and trying to get um my preparation right yeah Um, i mean the rankings too somebody can run fast in april but it doesn't mean you run fast in august when you need to so there's also a skill in being able to get the the timing right of um when you want to execute what you what you want to do and even with this last year too like with covid and all the restrictions and and changes which is also going to be something very interesting uh, over tokyo is you know how has that impacted people in their preparation or not and depending on what country you live in depending on how restrictions have been or not been depends on you know, or has, has had a massive impact on how you've been able to prepare. And, and ultimately that can have a, a huge impact when we, when we come to the games and it'll be interesting to see, um, do we see that, um, across performances or not? Yeah. It'll definitely be an interesting one to observe. Um, so you compete in the T13 class, which is a visual impairment classification. But in 2014, you were classed down to a T12 right before your competition, which essentially means that you your eyesight has gotten worse. Um, was that something that you were expecting to happen? How did you manage the emotion of that news right before competing? Yeah, it's not something I was prepared for at all. Um, and... I think because I, I wasn't prepared for it, then I, I did find it harder to deal with. It's just like everything has changed. You know, the people I was competing against has changed. The day, days out, the days you're on competing has changed. And um, I know Paralympics are trying to move away from getting classified at a, at a major championship. And I would not get classified at a major championship again because of the fact that, you know, everything changes a few days before you compete, which just doesn't really make um, sense. But I, um, I mean, I was only classified down for literally a year. So like, this is where sometimes parliaments can get a wee bit as difficult to understand for the average person, because there's so many categories and and disabilities. Um, But you can, you can find yourself, you know, very close to a a border or a boundary of, of, um, a disability and therefore you know one day you can sit one side of it the next day you can sit on the other side and 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 how that changes and again in in some categories that changes massively from being um competitive in an event to not being competitive at all um so yeah it's um i think it's a classification it's definitely one of the the challenging things and probably one of the things um uh people dread probably the most um yeah, I don't know what you find. Maybe, maybe your category is a wee bit more. You know, it's it's a bit more black and white because your arm length is your arm length, and and, and maybe it's not. But um, I don't know what you think. Uh, yeah, well, that you're, I was on the border for a very long time too, so it's always like it's there for a reason. But it yeah. is always a scary thing going into a classification. I was just interested to know if the emotion of being told that your eyesight was getting worse was affected you at all did it uh not really um i mean that's for me just something when i was diagnosed with my uh eye condition whenever age i was seven or eight that i mean looking forward there is no guarantees that it stays where it is um and i think that's just i've been fortunate enough that it has stayed where it is and, and maybe it has dropped slightly but it's slightly that you wouldn't notice it so um i mean that's all, always the possibility and honestly i'm just grateful that i i mean i've only five to ten percent vision but i'm glad that i have uh some vision compared to you know the, the challenges of being completely blind or obviously significantly more yeah definitely um you've represented ireland not just at para events but in able-bodied events how does that differ from para because i know in swimming Like I would compete at able-bodied events nationally and it doesn't really affect me that much. I might actually be a bit slower because I don't feel competitive. I don't have really competitors to race against. But I've heard in athletics that you might actually go faster. 
Um, again, it probably depends on the the level of competition you're in. Okay. So if if you're in um, a race and you know people are way ahead of you, then you might as well be running on your own, and it would actually probably be negative because. Um, so like in the hundred meters, if you feel everybody getting out ahead of you, then it means it puts you under pressure and therefore you start making mistakes and you kind of don't do your own race. But if you're in a race and people are around you, um, and therefore that kind of can help push you along, um, again, depending on the category. So it very much depends on the, the standard of, of race you're in, if it can, um, help or not um but for me to be honest all my races are um mainstream or or, or not para um and for me I'd, I'd prefer to i suppose use those opportunities to try run against people who are faster than me that can um it was in some way it can help you to run faster but you also have to learn to to run under pressure so like everybody thinks you just run as fast as you can from A to B for the 100 meters. Um, but like, how do you exert maximum effort, but keeping extremely relaxed and being able to kind of learn to do that under pressure is is what you, you want to do. And that's for me, one of the, the big things about running with people that are they're faster. So then when I get to compete, when it, when it matters, you know, I'm prepared for somebody who's right beside me. Um, and I'm, I'm, I know what to do and, and execute my race. It's a bit of mental training, really, is it? Yeah, it is. It's a bit of a like feeling what you want to feel throughout the race. Um, and again, I don't know if swimming is like that, but again, and, and maybe a middle distance race is different because we're talking 10 seconds for the 100 meters. So, so much happens in such a short period of time that it's also nearly about feeling you know, what it's supposed to be at different parts of the race. Um, so yeah, there, there definitely is a, a kind of focus. I know we, we hear about it and talk about it all the time, but it's like focus on, on you and what you need to do. Um, but as I say, when you think of 10 seconds and 40 something steps, like everything happens so quickly that if you react to somebody, the time you think about it and be able to do anything about it, you're another 20 meters down the track it's too late and you can't change um where in a, in a longer race you know you can you can make a, a slight mistake at the start and be slow and, and probably pull it back where the 100 meters you just once it's gone it's done and you can't really change anything i'm laughing because i can relate to this so much so in swimming my main event would be the 100 meter breaststroke and you really do have to swim your own race you really just have to trust that you're feeling the water right. Otherwise, you're going to slip the water. And it's so hard. It really is like a mental game trying to train yourself to trust the process of it rather than think go as fast as possible. Yeah. And, and no matter what you do, like the first time out competing, like things tend to go out the window a bit. You try to force it and, you know, you're trying to rush it and try to go too fast. And then over a bit of time, a um, few more competitions, you start to kind of feel it. And that's, that's the thing about trying to compete um, and trying to be, again, for me anyways, about being under pressure and training and trying to kind of get those mistakes, blow those cobwebs away. Um, so when you get to when it matters, obviously, uh, that you're, you kind of feel it and, and hopefully it comes together. You go on autopilot nearly. Yeah, it sounds as easy as that, but it never is, is it? <laughs> no. So, um what would a typical race day look like for you from the moment you wake up? Because I know athletics have their their heats and their finals on separate days, don't they? Again, that changes. Um, so like in London, they were on different days. Rio, they were on the morning and then the evening. And again, at Tokyo, I have morning and evening. So it just depends on what way they they do the schedule. So for Tokyo, it is on the morning session. Uh, again, depending on what what's the day look like, depending on what times you're on. But you obviously work out your whole day based on on the times you're you're competing. You know, you work back. You're going to be in the call room for twenty minutes 
half an hour. Um, you start warming up and probably an hour and a half. Um, and then you kind of start working back on, you know, what time you're going to, within that hour and a half, what time you're going to do some strides, do some drills, stretch, faster runs, runs out of blocks. Um, from that, then you work back, you know, an hour and a half from there is when I'm going to eat. Um, what time are you going to go on the bus? And before you know it, if you're on in the, in the morning or uh, 11 or 12, that's the, that's the whole, all, all the way up to lunchtime done. You come home, you have your lunch. Uh, you want to eat as quickly as possible straight after to kind of help on recovery. Um, and then do as little as possible for a few hours. People always say relax, sleep. I don't know if anybody actually sleeps, but um, and and then it's about doing that same same process again for for the evening um, and maybe adjusting. You know what you're going to do in in the warm up. So for me, I, I consider the heats as more of a warm up and get going, and then I would maybe fine tune things a little bit for the final and make sure I'm I'm running faster because you don't want to. Uh, use everything in the heats when you still, it's all about what happens in the final. Um, and yeah, that's the evening gone. You probably have anti-doping for testing after. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it's probably, I don't know what you would say, it's probably the, the day, once you once you start warming up and preparing, I, I, I don't mind all that. I think it's sometimes it's the, the waiting around beforehand or some sometimes the day before. Um, sometimes it's actually you guys are on a lot more than you know, you're running out of the pool all the time. Um sometimes it's worse being on, you know, one event and it's on in the evening. You've got all the time to kind of think about it. Um so yeah, I think it's just different for different people, isn't it? Yeah. It's funny you were saying I don't know if anyone actually naps in between heats and finals and I just interviewed Nicole Turner and we were talking about her race day prep as well and she was like and then I come home and I sleep and I can sleep anywhere <laughs> it's just funny how different sports like I know myself because I'm a swimmer I could sleep anywhere too yeah and even um at a like major championship between see you I don't know is that you guys just are used to like you are in and out of the pool you know you could be in four or five days and twice you know you once in the morning once in the evening like it, something you probably do a lot more often and therefore you maybe get used to it. I don't know what it is. So what you're saying is that swimmers are more hardcore and train more. Yes. No, I definitely <laughs> didn't say that. You're making up stories. No, I'm not. So tell <laughs> us, Jason, what are you competing in in Tokyo? What will our listeners have to look out for? I am in the T13 100 metres on, I think it's Sunday, is the 29th of August. Heats and final on the one day. Heats and they'll be in the middle of the night, Irish time, so nobody will watch that. And final, I think then that probably puts around before lunchtime, Irish time. So uh, tune into that is probably the one. That is the one. You're still unbeaten to this day, so it'll be an exciting one for everyone to tune into. Thank you very much for uh, joining me, Jason. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. So stay tuned to Off The Ball this month for more conversations in this series with thanks to Toyota and their Start Your Impossible campaign.